hello, you wonderful people. It's Drinker and Mauler here once again. Hello. hello. How you doing? Yeah. Well, we're all ready to go. Um, thank you, everyone who joined us the other night for Open Bar. As always, it was fantastic. And you sent mm -hmm. us a whole bunch of superb super chats. So we're going to try and get through them tonight and answer all your questions because there's there's a, some good ones in there. So yeah. let's get fired right in. I don't want to waste your time. Let's go. Uh, the first one was Mitch, who said, what about the Avatar Last Airbender discussion? Now, that's an interesting one, because I've said this before on stream, uh, I know precisely nothing about Avatar The Last Airbender, and so I'm singularly ill-equipped to offer any kind of opinion on it. I don't know if it's good or bad or what. From what I've seen, everyone hates the adaptation. I don't think it's as bad as, like, Cowboy Bebop's, from what I'm gathering. Yeah. It's more so it... It like it's like a, a soulless copy, like it didn't quite understand what it was doing. Uh, that seems to be the vibe, anyway. I can't say much. I've seen. I watched one episode on Netflix and got bored straight away. Uh, oh. I'm not a particular fan of Atler in general, but the the adaptation is worse by far than the cartoon. So I was like, considering how much I didn't really think much of the cartoon, I can't fucking be asked to watch an adaptation. I think it's even worse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Just nothing to recommend it from your point of view, then. And I suspect I'd be in the same boat then, since I don't know what to compare it to, and I'm not like super passionate about that universe or anything. I just, yeah. There's it should be said that people would tell you that you would love uh, Atla the cartoon. So maybe one day you could give it a shot, see what you think. Yeah, add it to the list of 5,000 other things I've got to watch and yeah, see how I get on. I mean, I, I'm just pleased that I'm doing Attack on Titan, okay? That's my first step. <laughs> Yeah. It's only taken me like two years to get around to watching it, but it's good stuff. Anyway, that's a different discussion. So, Kiki, Drinker, you mentioned that editing the open bars videos to a lot of time. I'm an editor, would like to help you out. Text based editing is a time saver. I say an email about how it works. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I don't recall saying that it took a long time to edit open bar. Like, they're just live streams, they don't really need editing. I was going to say, I um, can't even conceive of what you would have been talking about by editing open bar it's a bit maybe yeah. talking about clips or something even then it's really just cutting up clips from it so it doesn't really take too much time there's not heavy editing involved in that i don't know if they misspoke maybe and they hmm. meant like my regular review videos uh but yeah they're even they're not too bad like because they're short you know I, I don't produce like five hour extravaganzas like mr longman here so Hello. I've not really encountered that problem yet. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much for the, the offer. Uh, I think I'm doing okay at the moment, though. Appreciate it. Uh, Timmy04 says, what movies make you cry no matter what? For me, it's Train to Busan and Return of the King. Both good choices, I must say. Um, mm. For me, uh, if we're talking about actually like lump in the throat, a bit of a tear in the eye, it's probably going to be It's a Wonderful Life. Um, as sappy as that sounds, it never fails if I watch that around Christmas time. Uh, it always gets me. I think if you want a good example of an emotional payoff, it'll be that. Probably. Say that, um, End of T2 typically gets me. Yeah. When he's getting lowered into the metal. I don't know if that is the, specifically the part where John realizes what uh, the Terminator is saying. Yeah. And just how much that film does in terms of working in. The John sees him as his dad, basically. Yeah. Which is, it's just, it, it's, it's so well done because he's, he is a robot. That's, that's pretty much it. And uh, Sarah has so much respect for him by the end, too. Yeah. That moment where she takes his hands, it's like for, for a machine, it's a completely meaningless gesture. But for a human, especially her, yeah. it means like the world to show him that, that respect. So, yeah, it's a good scene. You'd almost think that was a really good movie. Yeah. Kind of. It was up there. Yeah. Uh, Campbell Patterson, part one. So I finished Lord of the Rings and it was so good. The world building was brilliant, best I think I've ever seen. The visuals were near flawless, greatly enhancing the practical effects. Perf Excuse me, performances were out of this world. My favorites were Sir Ian McKellen and Christopher Lee. The character's work was spectacular. My favorites were Samwise, Eowyn, and Aragorn. No Boromir, for shame. That's okay. But, Not everybody yeah. likes the, the Borister. I think we can all agree, though, that those movies were very good. And it's yeah. nice to see people still appreciating them now. So good stuff. Good on you. Um, kind of jealous, actually, that you got to rewatch them, you know, or watch them for the first time and appreciate them. You know, um, 
Weirdly, I'm actually rereading the Lord of the Rings books at the moment. I'm like halfway through Fellowship, and mm. wow, I'd forgotten how fun they were. <laughs> like, no, it's just yeah. Even though I know exactly what's going to happen, it doesn't matter. Like, it's just so nice to be in that world again. Yeah, uh, even few times that they wrote a bunch of books based after the movies, huh? Strange, but I know, know. it's crazy that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a, good, a good book adaptation there. Uh, Casey Boyd. Hawkeye was off to a good start. Barton referred to Kingpin as the big guy. He wouldn't say his name and was threatened by him, but they screwed it up. I mean, I'll take that as... I didn't yeah, watch I'll it. Take your word. Yeah, I mean, I didn't Yeah, I didn't watch Hawkeye either. That's That was the beginning of my... What would you call it? My journey away from the MCU mm -hmm. when I just skipped that one. That was the first Marvel show I think I just didn't bother with. And it's just grown and grown since then. And I'm a happier man for that, I think. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm really glad I got to experience Echo. I mean, that's of course a once in a lifetime job that. But and that's a, a movie, and you knock it right out, you know, about the length of so. Hmm. Oof. Yeah. Loki season two didn't bother. Uh, I did. Marvel, didn't bother. <laughs> do you do you feel better for having watched season two though? No, and it, what's funny as well is that like we're still releasing our Loki season two coverage. I think a lot of people are just like, "Oh, this did happen. There was this Loki TV show." Yeah, it's like, "Yep." And considering that mindset, it's like, "God, can you imagine how much money they did not make?" Yeah, same with all of them, really, because these are expensive. Yeah. When you add them all together, it's like 150, 200 million dollars per show mm -hmm. for like eight, ten episodes of absolute crap. Uh, yeah. Amazing to be able to blow that much money. Uh, Casey Boyd says, Will Mahler watch Attack on Titan if Drinker recommends it? Only Mahler can answer that. Is the whole thing out? Yes. And you're going to watch finished. the whole thing, yeah? Yeah. I'll probably well, review it season by season, maybe, because like to wait until I get to the end. like It could be next year or something by that point. Yeah, that's true. Well, if you watch the entire thing and then give me your thoughts, depending on what you say, I might be tempted, yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, another one from Campbell Patterson said, The spectacle was beautiful and felt earned. My favorite film is Return of the King. In short, I've never felt such, or I've never had such a good time since I swam the Great Barrier Reef. Hmm. Damn, that's a good point of comparison, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it. Casey Boyd. Muller, if we don't get a Steven Seagal EFAP soon, I'll expose your Welshness to the entire world. No. Well, that, that does sound like a tempting arc, and uh, we probably will do it someday. So, you know, a lot of these arcs where I say do it someday, like in my head, I'm ironically thinking about like, hmm, maybe 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> sort it out. And I think other people are like, ten I thought you meant like next year or this year. <laughs> like, uh, there's so know, much. There's I know there's so many potential arcs that would just be really interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you it's like you've been given this fantastic buffet in front of you and like all you can have is like one tiny little bit here and there. You know, well part of the to... problem, of course, it's much easier to produce the recordings than it is to produce the final edits. Uh yeah. So we have that problem as well. But you know, getting there. Hey, we've been doing the Star Trek movies, haven't we? So we have. We've been having fun with that, yeah. yeah. And... My, my edits take way less effort. <laughs> <laughs> They're just straight up watch throughs. Um, yeah, depending on the, the group of people that we're trying to like shepherd into these calls, uh, it can sometimes take quite a bit of effort, as we know. Yeah, just a bit. Um, Drinker, the John Cassar interview was awesome. Uh, what are you going to do if he wants to cast Pedro Pascal? <laughs> Walk away. <laughs> What's the latest thing Pedro Pascal's been casted? Like Gladiator Two, he's going to be in that as Wait, well. Wait, he's in that? Apparently, he is. Why is he in everything? Damn, I don't know. They must really I, think I, like uh, pulling him in is really good for um, you know marketing. I guess I don't know. Well, the, I keep asking myself: Is it them who are just like he's in super high demand and people just want him for everything, or is it like? the actor himself just saying like, well, you know, I've got a limited shelf life because I'm already like well into my forties and maybe these roles might start drying up before too long. So I've really got to make the most of this time. And I'm just going to take every project that comes across my it desk. It could be. Could be that. I mean, I don't know. I suppose as well, like something like Gladiator 2, having that opportunity to work with Ridley Scott, probably not going to come along many more times oh yeah i understand like i wouldn't it's not about really like like you know why would you have accepted that like i get it but you just you wonder how he's got the time and 
I guess the because uh, you know Last of Us season two that'll be happening soon enough, won't it? I would think so. Yeah, and you know he's still working his ass off on the Mandalorian. You know, recording uh-huh. a few lines of dialogue from his house. <laughs> so I'm sure they don't even know if he's going to be in Mandalorian and Grogu yet. Yeah, probably don't care. Because the thing about it is, I like, I don't... get a good enough impersonation, and you don't even need him. Which it's not hard to imp- like the voice requires very little vocal range. I mean, it's it's already heard through like some weird electronic distortion, like because it's a helmet radio yeah. I guess, that he's wearing, so it's it's pretty not recognizable as Pedro Pascal anyway. He doesn't really have a distinctive voice anyway, and it's not like his physicality or anything is particularly distinctive. Nope. So yeah, he is the sort of actor anyone could play that role. Um, but yeah. For me, Pascal fatigue is definitely <laughs> kicking in, man. Um, Marine Lad says, please wish Tom, uh, W1 of your fans, a happy birthday today. And I'm sorry, we probably missed that at the time then. But uh, Tom, happy birthday to you, mate. I hope you had a great yeah. day. Darth Soldier, drinker, you magnificent bastard. Guilty as charged. Uh, what are your thoughts on Altered Carbon? Altered Carbon Season 1. We all know that Season 2 was absolute crap. Yeah, that show really fell off in Season 2. Season 1, I liked it. Um, I thought uh, the casting was really good. The The performances were excellent. Uh, the concept was really interesting. This idea of being able to just download your, your consciousness into different bodies and they just become like hosts for you. Um, and you can leap through like decades or even centuries because of it. Uh, it's a cool idea. And what does it do to people who are like super rich and who could afford to essentially live forever because of this? Um, all very good stuff, and it poses a lot of interesting questions. So, yeah, that was a good show. Um, I think I, there was a certain point, like maybe midway through season one, where I, <laughs> where I was just thinking, I'm not entirely sure what's actually happening, <laughs> but I'm enjoying it. Um, yeah, it can get a bit complicated. Because I remember I've watched season one, but I can't quite remember it at this point. I just know to avoid the rest of it from what I've heard. Yeah, uh, and it's a shame because Anthony Mackie was in season two, and I like him as an actor, but man, he gets stuck with some shit projects. Yeah. Uh, Caesar Souza, drinker. The Ryan Drake trailer looks awesome. Funny. I always pictured you as Drake in my head when I read the books. Congrats on the film. Cheers. <laughs> Ryan Drake is considerably more athletic than I am, but uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the compliment. Um, Crimson Ghost. Longman, why is it that every time the Respawn Jedi series is brought up, you seem to dismiss their validity despite clearly not having played them? I implore you to give the games a chance, especially considering you're a Souls man, if I'm correct. I wouldn't call the story brilliant, but it is compelling. Dismiss their validity? What does that mean? I don't know. (laughs) They are video games. (laughs) I haven't denied their identity, don't you worry. Um, Do you consider uh, them uh, not particularly... Worthwhile I'm not very interested by him. I played the first one for a, I did a stream on it like when it first came out, and it was about three hours stream, and I got distinctly bored because of the mechanics. I was just like, this is very generic. Um, so I've just never been tempted by it, oh. which I think is I'm allowed to be not tempted by it, right? <laughs> I think that's I, allowed. I think you're allowed to not like something. I think that's okay. Yeah. Last time I checked, uh, don't worry. They are you. they are valid though. They They're valid. valid. They exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, says also thank you guys for getting me through my day at work every Thursday it's a joy to listen and laugh along and changes up the monotonous hell that is a 60 hour work week well I'm sorry that you're, you're hand to the grindstone on this one mate but I appreciate uh, appreciate the, the super chat and I'm glad we can give you a little bit of entertainment help the shift pass a little, little quicker hopefully um, no name what you call it says watch Dune 2 uh, a few hours ago, really hope this makes enough money so they make a third one. Everyone did a great job, but Austin Butler was outstanding. Uh, yeah, I think the cast was superb. I mean, that's a hell of a lineup of people, and I really liked Austin Butler's performance. I think he's going places, and yeah, I think he's going to do well. I thought he <laughs> did well as Elvis, but specifically in the sense that he put every last piece of effort into it. He's an actor that's trying his ass off, so yeah. I feel like he's going to have a performance at some point that might just make us go like, holy shit, that was something everyone needs to see, you know? Mm, yeah. He he could be the next Pedro Pascal. Who knows? <laughs> oh my In God. everything. <laughs> but yeah, I think it had a really strong opening weekend, if I, I'm not mistaken. Let me just check. 
I heard it beat projections. So, yeah, it's sitting at 178.5 million worldwide, which is pretty strong. That's good. Good news. Like I, we were saying this on Open Bar on Thursday, the hype around part two is huge compared to the first one. I don't know what they've done. Maybe it's just the marketing. Maybe people, you know, just came to appreciate the, the first movie more over the past year or two and now they're really pumped for the second one but it just really felt like there was a lot of anticipation for us so i guess that stoked the opening weekend mm -hmm. um i know i went and saw it in imax like a couple of days ago the screen was packed like there was no seats anywhere so there's definitely demand there yeah um david kelly Last summer, I mentioned with all of Hollywood's reboots, they should reboot Brokeback Mountain with Gal Gadot and Margot Robbie. <laughs> but after Madam Web, I think they need to add Sydney Sweeney to it. <laughs> I was, I think it's time for a Brokeback Mountain with women. I, I do agree. That's actually, exactly. it's, uh, it's ridiculous that men have had such a, you know, overwhelming dominance in that particular story. It's ridiculous. So it's time for yeah. women to have their day. I'm all about representation and exactly. Uh, you know, sharing things around so yeah sure give us that um and if you want to cast sydney sweeney i'm all in favor Fucking, funny, have you like, noticed how like in the past month the world has noticed her every, i know and she knows why like <laughs> yeah. you see that clip of her from snl <laughs> yeah like, yep <laughs> you know what i'm fine with that like if she's okay with with flaunting it a little bit i do i think go for i it. think that'll make a comeback because it's one of the a lot of like people will say one of the most fundamental fucking things about humanity is sex cells yep it and is. you can you know the push and pull between like a puritanical sort of cover-up versus a overly liberated like hypersexualized thing is like it just goes back and forth and back and forth and i think that i think boobs will get back into movies eventually yes Make boobs great again. That's a model yeah, I think yeah. we can all get behind. Uh, yeah, it's 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 really interesting how this has swung just over the past month or so. It's weird. Uh, Snex says, Mahler getting sick is definitive proof that masks do not work. <laughs> it wasn't sick. You just had a sore head. <laughs> like it's a migraine. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure you can't catch a migraine. Um, Derek says, Little Platoon's voice makes me question my sexuality. That's okay. He has that effect on all of us. But, yeah. Um, it's fine. Uh, I think Rob was saying, like, having you and Platoon on the same stream is just, it's <laughs> ear candy. <you> know? <laughs> uh, Casey Boyd, drink her. Rogue Elements looks okay and all, but we know it would have been a thousand times better if you hired Chris Stockman to direct. I know. And he was just busy at the time. You know, he's he's a serious filmmaker now. He is. And so he can't just mix with the likes of us. Of course he can. He's got it is curious, isn't it? Like, I don't know. If, well, what, what, you know, like you can, you could be like an executive producer of his, uh, of his film if you wanted to. I wonder if, and you have to, like, they do that thing with supporters where it's like a one on one call or whatever. I was just thinking <laughs> to myself, like, if I pay like some ridiculous number, then I was just like, hey, Chris, I wonder if he would just be like, fuck you. <laughs> 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 I, I just I think it'd be just his usual self, like, well, uh, I, I appreciate your feedback and uh I think we're gonna produce a really good movie here because I'm I care so much about the filmmaking experience. He does. Um, he really does. I think you missed a trick, by the way, on that um that little summary on EFAP when you did like he cares so much like you, you should have had the little clip from Doctor Strange where he's just running uh, it <laughs> oh you care so much don't you <laughs> yeah I, the memes are just like off the top of my head while I was rushing to get it done in time yeah. <laughs> one of them was like I was in a call with Friggin he was like wouldn't it be funny if you had the you're a great big phony after he says like I care so much I was like yeah that would work <laughs> more time more people more memes you sit on a throne of lies. <laughs> uh, Toxic Munger says, since today is a leap day, I'll go with March 1st for what happened 85 years ago. Such things as ammunitions dump exploded in Hirakata, Osaka, Japan, or they began a papal enclave to elect a new pope or even just high rags. I say go with the last one. It's short yeah. and direct and to the point. Maximilian Millerick. 
For the erotic nerd, is the DC animated series good to watch? Would you recommend watching it? The like, the new one. Don't uh, know enough about it. If it's anything made today, I think you can guarantee that it won't be. But yeah, we've we've all seen the the pictures of like Storm and stuff from the X Men. Um, looked good back in the day. They knew what they were doing. Uh, but as for the new stuff, I have no idea. I haven't seen it. Toilet Seatbelt says, Hail Drinker and Co. Just watched Whiplash for the first time. Excellent film. Good man. Mm -hmm. um, it did get me thinking, though. How many movies do you know of that end right at the climax? Uh, ooh, good question. The Wrestler probably does it. Like It ends with him leaping off the top turnbuckle to finish the match, I guess. So it's left ambiguous what happens after that. Yeah, there's got to be a few. A decent few. I'm just trying to think. Because, yeah, like, there's no aftermath in uh, in Whiplash. Yeah. The story is very much complete, but you're right, it does kind of end on the climax. Uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, I think, ends but really abruptly. <laughs> it's just like, I don't know if you've seen it or you're familiar, but, like, it's, like, Jimmy Stewart uh, ends up doing, like, a filibuster, and he's, like, on mm -hmm. his feet talking for, like, 90 hours straight or whatever ridiculous amount it is. Um to try and prove his innocence because they're like they're trying to they're trying to find a way to prove that he's not like a corrupt politician and he just needs to stall for time and they end up finding some kind of evidence to exonerate him um and it basically just ends with him passing out from exhaustion right on the senate floor and that's the end of the movie <laughs> like i mean okay yeah it, it resolves it i suppose but there's zero yeah. aftermath or anything it's fine they just knew exactly how to finish their story i suppose um was it? Yeah, I think it was Chris Gore who was saying something interesting. Like, there's this weird phenomenon now with modern screenwriting where they have a second, third act. You know, yeah. it's like you've got your traditional three act structure, and then there's always this desire to add something else on to keep the audience guessing, I suppose. And you know what movie kind of really set that into motion in terms of putting it into full view of a blockbustery one uh, recentish that's that kicks off this era of having lots of double third acts? At least it no. comes to mind. It'd be TLJ. Oh, yeah, I suppose it does, doesn't it? You have the Hyperdrive Kamikaze comes across as a big old third act, and then we reset, cool down, and build back up to a third act in uh, Totally Not Hoth. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. It's a weird it feels one. weird. Oh, I mean, the whole fucking film's a disaster, but yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, th this whole thing about the second, third act just becomes kind of exhausting. You know, you're already winding down after having the big climax and the big payoffs, presumably, with the main story, and then suddenly there's this tacked-on extra bit at the end. It's like, why are you doing this? I want to finish the movie now. I'd be inclined to say that there's probably a way to make it work, but yeah, I get that experience from a lot of them, like you just said. Uh, Blabs the Tower Tard says, you need Shad and Camelot to come Pete in the silly accent Avengers. I like picks and sports. <laughs> yay. <laughs> That's true. We should get them on. Yeah. Casey Boyd, you need to hire security for the open bar. I snuck in a ton of narcotics with zero difficulty. I mean, that's what we support here, though. So what can yeah. I say? You are allowed to pass. Rob Adamson, Mauer, I just watched your clip reacting to the Isle of Man flag. Have you fully recovered or does its bizarre nature still <laughs> cause you apoplexy? <laughs> Cheers. It's like, I, I mean, you know, it's just something that. You just have to think about how did that come come to be? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd they do it? Why? It's one of the rare times I've seen you just completely lose it. <laughs> I was great. very drunk. I think some people don't know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lieber Howe says, it's the fourth. Don't discount the uh, Jodorowsky cut. What yeah. Are we, what are we talking about here? The... Oh, are we talking about Dune? Yeah, like because yeah, there's been three the... versions so far. Um, the Jodorowsky cut was never made. It was just like a concept. No, I mean, but people go from obviously all the uh, behind the scenes shit that they saw, right? Yeah, I mean, based on the, the concept art and stuff, it looked bizarre. I'd like to have seen it, though. Yeah. Derek says, what's your favorite Bond movie? For me, it's GoldenEye, but mainly because of the video game. Uh, I, I could second the whole uh, GoldenEye thing. Like That was an excellent film. I think it struck the perfect balance between um, you know, action, intrigue, a new Bond, a great villain. Like, there was just a lot to recommend that movie. And mm -hmm. especially, like, coming in the aftermath of the Cold War, 
you know, it, it was very much a way of saying, like, hey, Bond can still be Bond, even if we don't have the traditional spying setup anymore. It accomplished a lot. Um, I don't know if you got a personal favorite, Mahler. What, Bond mm -hmm. film? Yeah. I mean, it's that one. No, no, that I'm was easy. <laughs> I'm doomed. Yeah. Psycho Hobo. I miss the really trippy prescience visions from the novel. Paul seeing the gory path of his jihad spreading across the stars was so sad and scary. You got little snippets of it in this movie, just not much. And I guess they're they're saving all that stuff because they, they want to keep it a little bit um, under wraps, I suppose. But yeah, there was some trippy shit in the book. Uh, OMG Puppies, speaking of soundtracks, Forbidden Planet was unique in merging sound effects and music into one unified electronic soundscape. Yeah, that was a weird one. They, they were great at building the tension in that film um, when the monster's approaching in the distance and you, you, the music almost takes on the tone of footsteps slash a heartbeat. Um, and it's almost like that effect that you got from the motion trackers and aliens, just slower and more ponderous. Mm -hmm. Very cool stuff. Cooler says, hello, guys. Gary, do you think Superman Legacy will be good? People really need to see that he is not one-dimensional. He is cool, and I love him. Well, Gary's not here, but, man, I want to believe in it, and I want to believe that James Gunn has got it in him to do a movie like this. I think if he's probably got a good chance of pulling it off, I suppose, because he is a good filmmaker when he's motivated by things, and I think he probably is motivated by this. I just... At this point, I don't know, man. I think it's going to be a tough one. I'm inclined to agree. Um, but Superman actually, deserves some help, I think. I tweet about how like it sucks that so many people haven't seen a good Superman in so long that some people just see him as like big, strong man who punches people. Yeah. I was like, damn. Yep. It sucks. Zach, <laughs> Zack Snyder's got a lot to fucking answer for. <laughs> I agree. Like, tanking one of the most popular comic book characters in history. Probably the most iconic one, really. Mm -hmm. uh, Cooler also says, Platoon, does the West Country have the worst accent? I think probably Birmingham is considered the worst. And no disrespect to people of Birmingham, but even you guys know <laughs> it's, it's bad. <laughs> you guys know. <laughs> it's like every time they open their mouths to speak to each other, they're just like cringing inside. Like, oh, why do I sound like this? <laughs> uh, Monolithic says, when visuals and technical achievement are the most notable aspects of a film to praise, what is it that elevates Dune over something like Avatar? Um, I would say because it's, there's a lot more intelligence behind the script and the cast and probably the dialogue as well and the themes that it addresses. Um, when you get down to like the conceptual level of Avatar, it's the most basic like um, environment good, like people destroying things bad, protect environment. You know that it's it's really basic stuff. Whereas Dune deals with a lot of the themes of you know the corruption of power, the the dangers of um, religious worship and and uh, the cult of personality, like systems of control, all of those things, like a lot more interesting and a lot more to grapple with than something like Avatar. I guess that would be what separates it. Um, yeah, I think that's fair. Avatar was fucking nonsense. Um, yeah. And I'm, I don't know, I, I find Avatar world a little less impactful compared to some of, some of the things they achieve at the Dune world. But maybe that's just personal preference. Uh, Darth Soldier. Can we just stop with the sequels, remakes of long dead franchises just for a quick cash grab? Oh, wait. Keep them coming for all the content that you create and the downfall of these creatively bankrupt companies. I mean, well, we aim to please here. And if there's one good thing that comes out of that, hey, we get to have fun pointing and laughing at all these things failing. So it's not yeah. all bad. Scott Christie Jones. Dude makes Lord of the Rings look mid. Uh, <laughs> don't think so it fucking it's not wishes. that good uh, Darth Soldier yes I graduated from the University of Redundancy <laughs> okay Crimson Ghost uh, you're late now I don't have anything to watch on the shitter do better well I'm sorry you know there's always mm. porn what can I say I'll keep yeah. it going for a while Marine Lad says Rachel Zegler won People's Choice who's going to win an Oscar um what did she win People's Choice Award for? Was it like best stunts or something? No idea. 
Um, yeah, I'm sure she'll win the Oscar for everything. Most remarkable human to ever exist. Uh, Heine Hole says, Mauler, Demon uh, Blackfire would mop the floor with Prime Bobby B. Damon. And um, maybe, uh, I don't know, like I was saying, you've got to respect uh, Robert Baratheon's power levels. Um, I don't know, like, I, I think, you know when you do, like, a person versus person fight? I'm usually pretty chill about it, like, an open, and I, I've got all the autistic questions. You know when you, someone says, like, Batman versus Superman? I'm like, well, wait. And then they're like, no, there is no way, and it's Superman. It's like, no, no, no wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Let's consider the possibilities. You gotta think, uh, you know, and I find them fun. Like, uh, one of the ones I always like thinking about was Master Chief versus a big daddy from, um, you know, like in Rapture and stuff. And it's like, yeah. well, it depends. Do they both have the best weapons of the universe, or are they both just equipped with their basic shit? And then where are they? And, uh, you know, what gear would you give Chief would, to make it fair? And there's just, just lots of stuff that I. And so in the in the case of this one, I don't know. Like if you Robert Baratheon, if uh if you put him if you put Damon between him and like uh uh Liana, I, I don't know. I feel like there's there's a chance that it could go a different way. That's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah, the problem being we never got to see peak Robert Baratheon in the show. And we're obviously led to believe that he's you know an absolute or he was like a, he was a, a unit warrior. In his day, yeah, but we didn't really get to see it. Um, I'm not sure what the books describe him as. Obviously, by the time we get him, he's a, a fat, middle-aged man who's kind of... Uh, oh, yeah, he's, he's, he's out of it by that, by that point. point, yeah. Uh, but yeah, peak Robert Baratheon. Be interesting. Uh, we, OMG we have a Game of Thrones fighting game. We have all the uh, people at their best. It'll be cool. Yeah. Uh, what's this? Sorry. Yeah, Blue Collar Loser says, great Dune 2 video. Watching it again now in RPX. Very good, man. Thank you. Uh, Casey Boyd says, Robert has a point, but we have too many misunderstood villains today. The Harkonnens being simple evil villain would be a response to that. I mean, I suppose, uh, yeah. Like, they're, they're, not, they're not really portrayed as just evil. They are motivated by their own self-interest. They, they were kind of disappointing for me in this one. Not um, Austin Butler's, you know, uh, contribution to the film, but certainly Batista and Skarsgård, I feel like they were underserved. Yeah. It's weird as well, right? When I see these little glimpses of um, the Harkonnen homeworld, it's like Giddy Prime, I think it is, where they've got this like horrifying black sun that shines down on it and everything's like bleached white. I just like imagine, what does a day in the life of an average Harkonnen citizen look like? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because it seems like they just spend their whole day like blowing stuff up or murdering people or just like screaming at, at uh, gladiatorial events. Like, how do they function? They seem like almost yeah, you know, like primitive um, ancient Rome or something like that. It's a, it's an odd one. Um, OMG Puppies says I enjoyed all three Dune versions, but the Sci-Fi Channel did the most accurate Baron played by Ian McNeese. Uh, there's a masterpiece scene after his nephew tries to assassinate him. Uh, yeah, he was a good, good Harkonnen, as I recall. Um, he played the character well. Um, less like over the top, um, just degenerate beast, like you got in the David Lynch version, and not as like clinical and cold as what you saw in the the Villeneuve version. So it was a nice balance between the two. Uh, mm -hmm. Lady Lady Karis says, I look forward to the Dune 2 movie, but I love the sci-fi miniseries. It introduced me to the world of Dune, and I think it deserves more respect. Fair enough. Um, shame the budget wasn't bigger. I think they tried to realize the world of Arrakis, and they just didn't have it with the technology at the time. You know, because this was like early 2000s, so CGI wasn't really there yet. It's yeah. a shame. Um, Flipping the Bird 85 says, I hope the Dune series continues and gets super nerdy and weird. Oh, and fuck the message. <laughs> Cheers, mates. <laughs> Thanks, man. Timothy Schult. I kind of feel bad for Brie Larson. Feige and her agents presented her with a sure thing in 2016, and she accepted. None of us could have predicted how much and how the world would change since then. That's true. Yeah, I mean, we said as much on Open Bar, I think. Um, ultimately, a bad career choice, but it probably seemed like a really good one at the time. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's understandable. Well, think about it, right? It would she would have made that choice in what twenty seventeen ish. I would assume so. If the movie came out in twenty nineteen, you know, you need like a year. To That's film like, it. yeah, everything was looking up for the MCU at that point. It was a huge, really good thing to be a part of. 
I wonder, hypothetically, because a lot of the backlash against her was like all those awards ceremonies and interviews where she came off not particularly likable. And I wonder if that stuff hadn't existed. Like if the only clips we had of her were her being just like funny and normal and like pretty likable, what would have happened then? In what way? Like what would have happened? Well, you know, would there still have been a backlash against her because she was playing this fairly unlikable character in, in a really unpopular movie or a divisive movie? Um, or would would they have given her a free pass? Because it's like, well, she's just an actor doing a job. It's not her fault. Like, let's just concentrate on the movie here. Um, I mean, she said what she said, right? Some of her quotes are really fucking stupid, but that at least we can now assume that she's either learned like not to say it pragmatically or that she the better outcome would be that she was like, man, I probably shouldn't say shit like certain movies belong to certain racial dynamics or something like that. That's really weird. Yeah. Um, or age groups like why it's almost like bad for the movie to say that but instead you know like maybe she's just come to understand like man a lot of people who i, I i'm almost like wishful thinking here it would be cool to have a quote from it where she was just like you know it's just so much i don't know about the perspectives of so many people that i would rather now just be more celebratory of film you know go the chris duckman route <laughs> <laughs> i worked out well for him didn't it well the funny thing is she's not a movie critic like i would i would actually like it if all actors had that attitude pretty much and i wouldn't yeah. blame them at all right like promoting a movie like madam web i find it funny that you have to be like yeah this movie's great it's so good you should do it to go see it i mean haven't um, the cast just embraced the meme at this point they're like everyone hates it we yeah. might as well just make fun of it and i, I think, think, I think it's good. well past having to respect it you know yeah, and I think good on them. <laughs> if you can yeah, just absolutely. step back and have a laugh at it. Yeah, we made a shit film. Fine. But like, it's so it's funny how you almost want to tell an actor you you don't understand how easy it is to make the public like you if you just say a couple of yeah. normal person things. Yeah, don't say. I don't know if things. it's. Well, I don't know if it's just they're put under pressure to. Yeah, they might be told to say shit. And yeah, it's got to be it's got to be kind of tough having to balance all that stuff because you probably got your agent like breathing down your neck, like, oh remember to say the right thing because the studio expects it. And ah, oh, jeez. Well, like I told you before, I I think like her YouTube channel was abandoned, right? So she only did it for as long as uh she was quote unquote supposed to. I mean, I assumed and I could be wrong here, I assumed she was just doing it because everyone was locked down and there was like literally no work. Like there was fuck I, all to do, so I was like, might as well do a YouTube channel instead. It was, it was just so produced. Like I, I feel like it might have been a um, desperate move by them being like, look, we don't have anything for you to do for the next however long because of the lockdowns and stuff, and you've been pissing people off like a lot. If you reconnect, if you do like you know your little do a YouTube thing for a whole year, we'll write into a contract thing that will get you your next movie. You'll probably leave the Avengers and just connect with, and then they leave, give her a list of like fucking 10 YouTubers, right? Didn't she do something with some, they, they're like famous YouTubers that you and I have never heard of. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it just felt like trying to heal her image a bit more. But now it's, everything's changed, right? Like all those contracts probably run the fuck out. And it's just like, do you even want to be in the MCU anymore? And the answer is no. <laughs> get out, Bree, save yourself. Yeah, get out. Uh, Southeastern Kaiju says, Happy Leap Day slash Irish Appreciating Month Eve. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Reality Palooza says, Hi, Drinker, Molly and Panel. I humbly ask if you give it a watch to The Snow Society. It's about the Andes tragedy. It's an amazing movie and the best story my country, Uruguay, has to offer. Full of masculinity, by the way. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks for the recommendation. Mm. Um, Blue Collar Loser. Love checking X. I'm not going to call it X. It's Twitter forever. And some yeah. drunken jerk tweets his copy of Final Fantasy VII taunting me. I wonder who that could be. I bought a digital copy because GameStop had no midnight release. I played nine and a half hours on YouTube. I hate myself already. <laughs> it's my game of the year. Uh, nice mm -hmm. one. Glad you're enjoying it. Maximilian Millerick says, how do you all get into film criticism? Also, drinker, how are your dogs? Well, actually, I've got my dogs here. Look, there's one. There's one. And the other one's there. I don't know if you can see her. She's probably just out of shot. Hey, Lara, stick your head up. You see it? Uh, maybe just a little. There you are, look. Well done. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so they're doing good. Like, he's got his giant caterpillar thing there, so his, he doesn't <laughs> slide off and bang his head against the, the, the door. Um, but yeah, how did we get into film criticism? I don't know. Like, for me, it, it was born out of, like, storytelling. Um, always enjoyed it. That's why I got into writing. And I kind of was always interested in the flip side. Like, hey, I can build stuff. 
kind of in my head with what little um, creativity I've got, isn't it interesting to deconstruct it as well and see what makes it tick? So that was always my interest. For me, it was a bit of a meme with my family that I was just always obsessed with. I don't remember a time where I didn't love watching movies on TV. I just always did. And I think I would like I've said several times I blame my dad fully. He's uh, he loved movies and TV, and he was like, "Come watch favorites with me." I still remember where I was when he first showed me Predator. Like, <laughs> and uh, it was, I've said it before, but I was just like, "They made a sequel," and he was like, "Yeah." We could watch that. <laughs> I remember just thinking, like, why did he say it like that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, no shade to Predator 2. It's just not as good as Predator 1. Um, the, but yeah, but, you know, from there, just always, always watching, loving them. And yeah, it's nonstop talking about movies just easily translates into a criticism of them. And I think that what, what happened to me that was a big thing was just I just didn't understand why all movies weren't awesome. And I wanted to figure out why in my own head, right? Like, what's the difference? Why why are these ones working and these ones aren't? Yeah. Um, beyond just feelings, I wanted to figure out what was going on. Pretty good basis for it, then. This worked out well. Um, Azrin says, given that Hollywood has shown they can still do books to movies, are there any books or book series which you'd love to see made into a movie? I'd love to see for a Dwarvish Dirty Dozen series and the Epic of Gilgamesh or Beowulf. Um yeah, fair dues, man. I think in terms of like the books that I enjoyed or whatever, like most of them have already been done. Like I can't really think of any series at this point that I want to see adapted that hasn't already been taken on in some degree. So, yeah, there's not I much left. See, um, a Lovecraft adaptation that I adore instead of tolerate. That would be a good one. Yeah, Let's see if it can be done. Could well, I guess in the Mountains of Madness though is pretty cool. Mouth of Madness, sorry. Mouth of Madness, yeah. Uh, no, that was that was fun. I did like that. Um, what would happen if Mike Flanagan tried to take on Lovecraft? He's pretty... He's. Uh, I'd be as worried about him doing it as me trying to come up with ideas for it because of how nuts and bolts he is. Like, um, Lovecraft demands quite a... That's partly why I want to see more of it is because I find it... I want to see a creator do something with it. That blows my mind because I have trouble coming up with how I would want to see it be. Does that make sense? Like, <laughs> I uh, I wanted someone to blow me away with it. It's like, could Mike do it? And it's like, maybe. He, but the thing about him is that I find I tend to he he, he makes sure you understand everything that's happening. And like, yeah. I don't know if that that works with Lovecraft. Though, I mean, if he's up for the challenge, fuck it, you know. Um, yeah, I was <laughs> trying to do Lovecraft with the approach that he took for um, like the haunting of. Bly Manor, yeah, that'd be a tough one. Um, did you ever? If you turned fucking that? Lovecraft into a robots, I think people would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that too. Yeah, I was thinking more about the mechanics of ghosts and how it's really like sharply defined in that. Show. Yeah, like he really wants you to understand their limitations and functions and stuff. Um, I was going to say as well, like, because I recommend uh, Love, Death, and Robots to you, and there's an episode that's all very Lovecraftian. It's like a special forces squad it's, in um, Afghanistan or something. They go into like caves. Yeah, I like it, but like no more than I like most Lovecraft adaptations, which is th weird things happen, weirder things happen, something incomprehensible happens, everyone dies. Hmm. Which I feel like there's got to be more that we can explore than that. Um, I love the designs of a lot of the creatures in basically everybody's ideas toward Lovecraft, but this is part of if it's so hard to fucking talk about because I'm trying to explain how hard it is to conceive of. I want to see an adaptation that makes me go, wow, I un uh, that is portraying the unportrayable. Do you understand what I'm saying? I got you. Yeah. So I, mean, like, I don't even know what that looks Lovecraft, like. Yeah, but like I want to see someone try to pull it off. Um. Butio says, Paul wrestling with his destiny and seeing his own future self as the main villain was by far the most compelling element of his character journey in the book. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's the core of Paul's character, I suppose, so it makes sense. Um, I think it might have been nice to get a bit more of that and go in a bit more depth, I suppose. Because I was never entirely clear on what suddenly changes Paul's mind. You know, he's very much of the mindset, if I go to the south, then that's going to ultimately lead me on the course of, like, launching a jihad against the entire galaxy, and it's going to destroy everything. Uh, and he's dead against it. And then he just kind of changes his mind, and off he goes. And I feel like there wasn't enough connective tissue there, which is a shame. Um, Charles Hurst says, 
the book does a lot of the things that you guys describe. Gurney and Stilgar disappearing in the face of Paul's ascension was part of the message. Great men are made small because of the fanaticism that Paul inspires. Okay, yeah, I can get that. Uh, um, I didn't get that from the film. Like I said, Gurney felt like a, an afterthought or a lot of his shit got cut, I'm assuming. Well, that's what they're saying, yeah. like the, You get that in the book. You, the, you don't really see it so much in the movie. Uh, Puck okay, says, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Philistines tend not to like Blade Runner 2049. Maybe you should read more than comic books. Yes, that's meant in good humor. <laughs> good. Uh, I, I've seen people be baffled by the fact that me and Gary think 2049 is garbage. And I'm just like, as people to the point of being like, bet you can't even come up with one reason. It's like, you don't want to get us started talking about that fucking movie. Blade yeah. Runner is one of the best and most important films of all existence. Blade Runner 2049 has no fucking idea what was so good about Blade Runner, as far as I'm concerned about it. Yeah. It, it, again, like, people are enamored with the visuals of it, which is fine. It looks lovely. But, yeah, in terms of the story that it tells and the, the ideas it's grappling with, it's just like a watered-down version of Blade Runner. It doesn't do anything new. And I just I still don't understand what the point of it is. I feel like it wastes a lot of its time, too. It's yeah. got some really basic nonsense plot shit going on in it. Um, oh yeah, the, the mill stuff. The the fucking like Rachel from the first one, who's just bones, and like that becomes a central plot point, and it takes fucking ages to get it resolved. Mm. Like, why, let's not go into it. Maybe one okay. day. Oh, could you imagine yeah. that you fat movies on that fucking thing? Ooh, it'd be a bloodbath. <laughs> David March says, "I didn't like the first movie for the same reason. Give me Patrick Stewart screaming for Duke Leto any day." <laughs> okay. Uh, Rory Swain says, hail to the drinker and co. My mate is planning to, uh, my stag do. Any suggestions on what to plan for one? He doesn't know what to plan. Um, well, I, I would say the, the best one I've been on, um, we went to Eastern Europe and we shot lots of guns. Uh, we went to lots of strip clubs and we shot lots of strippers. So, I mean, what's not to like? Well, I'd say do that. Um, anything that involves like something slightly dangerous, like if you could do quad biking or shooting or something like that or like fucking um bungee jumping do that and copious amounts of booze thrown in as well you can't go too far wrong mm -hmm. i mean damn man if uh if he's your mate he's your best mate and he's your best man um he should know you he knows what you like i'm sure he'll he'll figure something out i would even go so as far as saying like as long as you know, i was just thinking like you have been axe throwing uh once yeah I feel like that with alcohol. Well, maybe that's <laughs> <laughs> that's how I ended up in any. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, just something that makes it feel different than usual. Even that's a good start. Yeah, I don't have it just be a night out on the town. Like fucking hell, you could do that anytime. Like try and throw some some different stuff in there. Um, Justin Hudson Guitar says, not surprising that Villeneuve has pulled off Dune so far looking at his past work. Highly recommend Prisoners. It's a very dark Fincher-like film. It is, yeah. It's. Um, I never would have picked him to direct a movie like that. You know, he seems more at home doing like the big epic movies like Dune, where you, like huge panoramic vistas and stuff, where you really get a sense of the epic scale of it. Um, he was an odd choice for Prisoners, but it was a good movie, so I can't fault him there, I suppose. Um Marine Lads says, Australia's education minister, Jason Clare, 1987, only three Star Wars films should have stayed that way. Bet you two agree. What films uh, need a 4DX re-release? Um, so with 4DX, yeah, like what can, what would we like to see get re-released? I'd assume you'd have to like upscale it and stuff and work in all Did kinds it? of shenanigans if it's an older thing. Yeah, if they're talking about like, like a genuine one where the, we got the just better clarity on a thing rather than, you know, upscaling and stuff. I don't know. It's um, going to be T2, hasn't it? Imagine that. 4D eggs. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I suppose there's just all kinds of options. Some of them I'd probably like to pick would be TV shows. A lot of them get very underserved by um, sort of like updates and modern interpretations and stuff. Because they weren't... Yeah ready for it when they were made sort of thing or didn't expect it of it when they were made i could uh i could get behind this idea of just only ever having done the ot with star wars and if we had to sac if we had to like sacrifice the prequels so that the sequels would never exist i'd make that sacrifice i would do that for the good of humanity 
and you guys would thank me for it. If maybe not at first, but you would eventually. I mean, I feel bad, but if I could re-roll the prequels, I would. And that by that I mean, you know, give it another go. Like I wouldn't mind giving George a second try with the prequels. <laughs> like please, you know, just <laughs> just uh, cheering uh, him on on set. Like come on, George, you can this do time it. we could do it. We know what went wrong last time. <laughs> Uh, Lieber Howe says 2001 is an art film and boring as fuck. I mean, not an entirely controversial opinion. It is not exactly a, a page turner as far it's, as movies go. But It's probably the number one choice of what's a ratio of greatest executed film ever and the result of boredom. But remember, Blade Runner is in that selection as well. For people in general, not for me, I'm just saying. But maybe, maybe for me with 2001, I haven't seen that in a while. It is, I mean, it definitely weaves an atmosphere, that's for sure. Um, but it is a slow-paced movie. It's a slow burn. Um, and it's the the atmosphere of creeping dread, I suppose, that you, you get from it. Um, but yeah, it's one of those ones I don't feel that compelled to re-watch it. It's just not that entertaining for me, I suppose. Um, Ghost in the Craig gave us a super sticker, so cheers, man. Uh, Normie says, dump all Disney Star Wars shows and films. Bring in this panel and adapt Heir to the Empire books as the true sequel trilogy as it, as it always should have been. I think the three of us could probably, or however many we had on the panel, um, we could come up with something halfway decent. I think if we were given like a, sure. a few months to come up with ideas, write some scripts, we could probably do all right. I'd put it in our hands more than I would Disney, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, Jackson Lindgren says, salutations, drinker. I'd love to hear your thoughts on No Country for Old Men, if you would consider doing a video about it, or if it's one of the videos that would qualify for your drinker recommends or an extra shots video. I think at this point it would probably be an extra shots one. Um, but yeah, I would probably save my thoughts for that. I mean, I remember watching it uh, at the time, probably the first time I watched it, I didn't quite get it. I didn't quite get what it was trying to show us. Uh, and it was only probably the second or third time. No, I've must have been the second. I don't think I've seen it three. Um, I kind of understood a lot better what the film was driving at. And yeah, fair dues. It's a good one. Apparently the book is extremely challenging. Um, I think it was considered like almost unfilmable. And so it took a long time for this one to get made. But yeah, superb cast, superb performances. Very interesting film. Um, Big Hat Legion. Drinker, I just beat Ornstein and Smo. Uh, Nerdrotic, I just beat the soul of Cinder. Mauler, I just beat uh, third consecutive opponent in a debate over the best souls game. Rags, I just beat Gwendolyn fan art. <laughs> okay. I mean, Drinker's not going to know what any of that means, but yes. Okay, yes. Um, John Gates says, any of you gents going to play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth? Me. A uh, stupid Canadian company I got the collector's edition from us is going to be a day late, so I guess it's time to polish off that Helldivers 2 Platinum Trophy tonight. Good luck on that, yeah. man. I feel like I've waited ages for some good games to come along, and then there's a bunch of them all at the same time. So, yeah, I'm just going to finish off Tomb Raider um, tonight, probably just after this recording. Um, then I get straight on to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and I want to play Helldivers as well, but I feel like by the time I get to it, it'll be irrelevant, which is a shame. Well, get to it. Uh, and people are still playing it right now, so you can you can get in. It's not over I'll yet. Uh, Andrew Lee says, for any beer drinkers, what do you recommend for stouts or dark beers? Um, yeah, I don't drink many stouts of that sort, to be honest with you, so my recommendations wouldn't be very long. It's pretty much just Guinness. Um, yeah, I prefer like lagers and uh, pilsners, that kind of thing, rather than stouts. It's just not my thing. They're quite heavy going. Um, Ian Soforth says a warehouse of pure imagination <laughs> that was the Willy Wonka experience yeah. <laughs> uh, John Kelsey gave us $10, cheers mates Daniel Omerod says the factory also has a villain called the unknown yeah we tackled that, terrifying terrifying, yeah Psycho Hobo, I think June would have served better as a show than films no I think films were okay I think two movies to cover the first book that was probably enough um Star Wars Lego Rob says, regarding Dune, I agree that the characters are just not memorable. As a kid, I remember uh, from the film in the 80s is the floating fat man, all-star panel tonight. <laughs> the floating fat man. <laughs> the, the, 
the special effects for the Lynch movie are, are something else, like when you see it now. Ooh. Mr. Case, has anyone read Rendezvous with Rama? It's Denis' next book adaptation. Great fucking sci-fi. Cheers. Never heard of it, I'm afraid, no. Um, driving ahead, I love Dune Part 2, having read the first four books of the series. Nice one. Uh, Erechius says the fire festival for kids. <laughs> Pretty much, that's, that's what it looks like. At least they're not, like, you know, stranded on a desert island. Uh, Roger Rubio, super line up. Enjoy a slice of pie on me. Thanks, man. Yeah. Psycho Hobo, old sci-fi has some major problems when it comes to memorable characters, especially from Heinlein, Asimov, and Clark. I mean, maybe as writers, they were just focused more on ideas than, you know, than people in them. I suppose that's part of the danger with sci-fi, isn't it? You get so caught up in the, the world that you're creating and the ideas you want to tackle. You can neglect other aspects of it. It would also just be um it can be a difference of what is valued as part of what could be called character. Like if you have a person who is a stalwart scientist who's desperate to, you know, save the world with a cure for blah blah blah, like someone could be like, That's the most interesting thing ever. We could be like, Yeah, but what do they like care about beyond that? Who are they? You know, and someone could be like, Oh, I mean, sometimes it's a factor of the storytelling as well. Like when we talked about 2001, like Kubrick intentionally wrote Bowman and Poole to be as robotic and like almost um, yeah. you know, flat and monotone as they could because they're it's representing like human technology and, and um, reliance on it almost turning us into machines and losing our basic humanity. And that's fine. But like it's it also does mean that when you're watching the movie there's very little to connect with with those characters because they don't act like humans they don't express much emotion so yeah it's a it's an odd one um mega spidey man drinker could you please do the goldfinger bond exchange with mauler uh with you as bond and mauler as goldfinger also favorite bond lines and why okay so do it then i suppose <laughs> so goldfinger do you expect me to talk no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> I'm not going to do the, all the other stuff about Project <laughs> Grand Slam and stuff because I cannot remember all that dialogue. Um, what's this next one? Uh, favorite Bond lines and why? I think it's got to be the one-liners, you know, when, when yeah. he gets a kill. Um, when Connery spears a guy with a spear gun and he's just like, I think he got the point. <laughs> Good stuff. I like that. Well, or uh, for England, James, that's no for me. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Lord Wahoo. Did men avoid Metroid because Samus is a female? Tomb Raider because of Lara's uh, pyramids? It's almost as if men like women on screen. Good women. Attractive women, you might say. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a crazy idea, but like Mahler said earlier, sex sells. Uh, John Krushke says, so it sounds like I'm going to have the same criticism for part two as I had for part one, that they took all the political maneuvering and politics out of movies uh, that were the core of the book. I don't think they took all of the political maneuvering out. It's definitely there. Um, I just think the book, by its nature, provides a lot more context because it can go into crazy, like, elaborate explanations for what all these different factions are about and what they do. Again, I just worry people who haven't read the books watching that film are just going to be like, what the fuck are these people? Like, what are all these crazy, like, Benny Jesser up to? Like, how do they, how do they function? It's, it's a lot to take on, I suppose, to condense into movies. Um, yeah. John Gates, question or recommendation? What's a movie that's out of your usual genres that you love? For me, it's Your Name, a romance film that is now my favorite all time. Not a movie crier, but this one would make even Mauler cry, I think. Wow. Mm. It's harsh because Moller doesn't have a soul. <clears throat> exactly. Sold it for drinking money. Uh, outside our normal genres? I don't know. Anything that's like leaps out at you? Well, what is our normal genres? If if I suppose yours might be action and mine would be what? <laughs> I don't even know. But the both of us like to explore basically all the genres uh, if we have reason to, I would imagine. But I might go with Remains of the Day. That's a film I quite love, and it's basically a life of a butler and yeah, a, so a, like unrequited romance it's thing. It's like it's very. I would happily even call it dry. I don't mind saying that, but like it, I love what it, the point it makes, and I love the performances in it. And it's um, it's a very, <laughs> it's an understated romance that film. 
And so you'd be like, yeah. that doesn't sound very exciting. It's like, it's not. I, I think fucking good though. Yeah. Um for yeah, it's gonna be the same for me. I suppose romance would be outside my normal wheelhouse. It's not movies that I normally would seek out. Uh maybe Lost in the Translation. Quite enjoy that. I think it's good. Mm-hmm. Like Bill Murray in it, like Scarlett Johansson. Um yeah. I suppose that'd be my pick. Um Dark says I watched Supergirl because of how hot she was. Okay. Good. That's a good good reason. Uh, OMG puppies, a Soviet Willy Wonka would not have been boring. It would have been trippy as fuck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Didn't they do, the Soviets do an adaptation of Lord of the Rings? And it's absolute insanity. Uh, so they did. There's, I, there is I know a you're Soviet talking version, about it. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's live action. I'm pretty sure Gollum looks absolutely insane. Um, yeah, it's interesting stuff. Albert Nada Retro. Put a sock in it, Robert. Everything doesn't have to cater to women, especially since all the makers think is dumping on men will bring in the female fandom. By the way, that um, GH saga is called The Ice Princess. GH? Guitar Hero. Ah, okay. Yeah, let's go with that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Solid Dogs Deep State Center says, what's everyone's take on the recent Starship Troopers and mum media literacy debate that occurred? Yeah, that was baffling where where did that come from it's like for a few days everyone was just angry about starship troopers well it's it's all infected by politics it's uh you have to remember the the media side of youtube is a place where conflict happens on the level of are the prequels any good are the you know is is decade a replicant like all, all that sort of stuff is real fun and can get passionate and sometimes people can even say wow you're an idiot for thinking the not what i think you have to remember the politics realm people get hyper fucking fixate and angry instantly to the point where they're like they want to argue that legally you should be killed and stuff right like movie pops a little uh sort of drip feed into that and so i guess what i'm getting at is that starship troopers like we love talking about it as a movie for all the different things it achieves and then talking about its meaning you know i've been exposed to all kinds of analysis of that film while just loving it since i was super young for what it is and then like being like, oh yeah, it's about this. Oh, it has this. This is like my mind has changed on that film so many fucking times listening to so many different people talk about it until I was like, okay. And then I watched it and I was like, this is what I think of this film now. And I was gonna say it would be interesting to hear you and Sargon talk about it. But <laughs> what happened on Twitter was just a huge political faction that are like Starship Troopers points out the if you like this, then you're a fascist. And then a bunch of people are like, Well, it's actually in an inept attempt at satirizing it from the director. Uh, you know, and and the back and forth happens, and then everyone calls each other media illiterate, and then no discussions actually had. It's more of a proxy war to just say my opponent politically is evil. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's why that's I prefer. Good. Whatever that no, happens, that like, right. and just imagine living in that world. I feel like that would slowly rot your brain. Just being so angry all the time, and, and just looking for that opportunity to like yeah. just destroy people. There's a lot of memes that capture the attitude right like the you know this is a satire but be careful because you wouldn't want to believe in in this shit because you could become a fascist then someone looks down and is like what the fuck is wrong with you like what are you talking about why are you even saying any of this yeah. and then like if official accounts are like yes remember fascism is not good you feel like an actual baby you're like what why you stop and it's like, why can't we have the fun that the film is having that you're telling us it's having? You know, the film is going like, woohoo, with all yeah, the different things. Like, like, uh, want to join them. It's like guns go brr. You know? yeah, and the bugs <laughs> go boom. But yeah. then, of course, when you actually get into the discussion, it gets a lot more complicated. And uh, I find it all very fascinating. But the, there's not, everybody's so fucking trigger happy on calling everyone else retarded when it comes to analyzing Starship Troopers. Yeah. Yeah, I was happy to sit that one out, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. Um, Maximilian Millerick says, do you think uh, that the theory of a good villain makes a good hero still holds up today? Yes, I, I tend to agree. Um, we, we discussed this last time, I think, similar question came up, like, you know, a, a hero is only as good as the villains that they overcome. I, I think there's definitely ways that you can give them other challenges and other problems and stuff to to take on, but, you know, a, a story needs an antagonist. It needs some kind of obstacle for the hero to you know, pit themselves against. And so, yeah, I guess if you've, uh, what I'm saying is if you've got a really weak, crappy antagonist, then there's less of an accomplishment in beating him. 
Uh, and so for from a dramatic satisfaction point of view, you want an interesting antagonist who's going to challenge the hero in, in interesting ways, ideally. I'm not sure where I sit on the subject. <laughs> like, there's just so many things I'd have to consider. I don't want to do the autistic thing where I'd be like, what do you mean by good? Yeah. Like, because could, could a good hero exist in a film where there is no villains? There, there's probably an interesting video I could make on that. Um, whether my perspective would be interesting, it's another matter. But like, I think it's an interesting topic to discuss. Like, how how else can you get around this? What makes a hero interesting? What makes them good? You know, it's, it doesn't have mm. to be. It doesn't. Does it have to be like a, an equal and opposite villain, or could it be other things? I don't know. There's there's a good topic there probably. Um, Final Morpheus completely agree with that super chat. Twenty forty nine is way better than the original Blade Runner. Not a joke. OG Blade Runner is a beautiful turd. I do not agree. <laughs> it's just like a beautiful movie. Just signing off with the internet after hearing that, you know, just too much. It's got it's got to be trolling. It's got to be shit story. Albert Nado Retro says Lois Lane is one of the worst characters ever. She treats Clark like crap until she finds out that he's Superman. She's a power hole. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not entirely wrong there. Um, Pudi Evans says all these women are going to have to get third shift jobs to replace all the men that have to work those crappy shifts. Indeed. Um, Captain Cisco, what do you guys think Aliens Whistleblower and the government admitting that UFOs are real and Bob Laser and David Crush claim that we have alien bodies and alien spacecraft hidden by the US government? I think it's bullshit. <laughs> don't believe in it. Uh, I, I don't, don't know enough about it to say anything. I was like, all right. I just think it's bullshit misdirection. And yeah. Um, are you telling me that aliens have only ever visited Earth and gone out to fucking um, farmers in the middle of like Buttfuckville, Alabama, or whatever? And like that's the only place that they choose to land, and like that's where they they rectal probe people. I mean, I just don't see it. <laughs> Not buying it, man. Um, Intelligent Crayon Eater says, "I think the problem is all the money thrown at streaming several years back. They bought long contracts like Rings of Power, and now they're stuck." I don't know. Do you think there's merit to that? Like they all invested super heavy in streaming, and now it's like the bottom's fallen out of the market, and they're stuck with all these crappy shows that they don't know how to end. Hmm. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, Death Judas, what are your opinions on Escape from LA? Is it true already? Thanks for the good show. Um, yeah, it's, it seems like it's come to pretty much to that point. Um, they haven't had an earthquake destroy most of the city, so they're still hanging in there, but. The actual movie, absolute dog shit. Um, crap. Yeah, I don't think John Carpenter can even be happy with that. He must be ashamed of it. Um, what a waste of Kurt Russell as Snake Plissken. Yeah, it's shit. Um, Scotty says, why does Discovery stand out from other Trek shows? Unlike other Trek shows, Discovery is a freshly squeezed dog shite on your expensive Persian rug. That is true, yeah. So it's it stands out in how refreshingly terrible it is. Uh, Jay Fraser says, Hail gents, favourite Top Gear and Grand Tour moment. Oh, that's a good one. Oh. God, there's like a selection between about a thousand of them. Um, I think that... <laughs> it, it could be when they froze... I forget the specific context, but freezing the car keys in a bucket of piss. <laughs> <laughs> I liked uh, when they were on scooters going through like uh, Vietnam and they gave I think it was um, Clarkson they gave him like a, a, a present and it was a wooden ship and it was instead of just like this little thing like that that you could kind of carry with you it's a fucking gigantic thing like the length of my desk that <laughs> he's got to like strap to the back of his uh, mm -hmm. um, his bike oh no it was Hammond that they gave that to and he just kept crashing into things and destroying it <laughs> Uh, that was good stuff. Um, Libor Hal says they couldn't do anything with the scroll or Cree Wars. Normies don't have a frame of reference for those stories. Yeah, but that's that's why you use good writing to provide that reference. Yeah. Uh, Last Bandit says, Hi, Drinker. As you love Westerns, may I suggest a series called Hell on Wheels? Great storytelling. I'm sure Gary will agree. Has he seen it then? I assume. Uh, I assume. All right. Chops says, hey guys, been really enjoying Masters of the Air, which made me go back and watch uh, Band of Brothers and the Pacific. 
On reflection, I can't understand why the brutality of war has been dumbed down, in my opinion. Am I being mad? Um, well, those shows didn't dumb it down. They were brutal, man. Um, I don't know if you're referred to... Yeah, Masters of the Air. It does seem a little bit tame compared to things like Band of Brothers, but it's maybe the nature of the show. Um, I've been reviewing it like week on week with uh, with the Outcast creative and a few others. And it's been quite fun just watching the show progress. But yeah, there's been some spotty episodes. You know, you can either tell it's like a bottle episode that just need filler. Um, there was one that was, I think, written by the director of Captain Marvel. And you could tell it was like they, they transposed some of those Captain Marvel elements in to that episode. And it wasn't good. It felt like writing straight out of the 2020s instead of the 1940s. But hey ho. JDA Productions says, is this the Helldivers 2 squad meetup? Lol. Well, we need to do it. I mean, it no. It's available on all the different consoles and PCs and stuff, isn't it? It's like cross-platform. Yeah. Does it do cross-play? As far as I know, yeah. Okay. Interesting. I'll get back to you on that one. Uh, only if I can have Gary on my team. <laughs> I think he's going to be a good asset. Uh, Casey Boyd watched John Wick 1 for the first time and liked it. I'm not sure if I should watch the rest, though. Nah. Probably just give him a miss, yeah. Oof. Uh, Ink Jordan. The Marvels, Madam Web, and Echo were panderers, but as they are pandering, uh, giving a gay, blind, albino Spartan a grenade launcher in Halo, I think you're saying, are they panderers? <laughs> you don't know about any of that, because you haven't watched it, have you? No, and I'm quite happy with the fact that I haven't watched it. So There is a blind gay man in Halo that when Reach is attacked, runs around with a grenade launcher and just <laughs> shoots again at me. How did that show get made? Oh, that was hard to watch. We were losing it. We were like, why the fuck? And it's like, it's a war. And he needs to do everything. Everyone's got to participate. It's like, he is blind. He <laughs> has a fucking grenade launcher. <laughs> What's wrong with you? More blind people can contribute to God. You bigot. Uh, Aravin Sevilla seems says, Drink her at Mauler. The year is 2017. Kathleen Kennedy has a gun to your head and Ryan dead in the basement. You have to write The Last Jedi by having Luke pass the torch off to Ray. How would you do it? I cannot answer that fucking question. Like, it with zero time to prep and zero time to think about it. But, you know what's funny? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, just quick on Stargriff. I think someone said, like, you know, Ray movie, how do you do it? And, um, I think I think Theory was just like no, just no, 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 we're not, no. And then uh, I was like, what if she dies? Like, what if she get killed? And he goes, mm, yeah, okay. And I just like burst out laughing. I was like, you're only gonna have a Ray movie if she dies. I get it. <laughs> like that's the, 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 he's like that's the compromise. I will allow it if she is killed. I'm I'm reasonably confident I could write you a half decent script that would pass the torch from Luke to Ray, but do it in a respectful way that doesn't tarnish his character. I think that can be done for sure. Um, it's just down to the implementation. How much time would you want to do it to the best of your ability to write, write the that? script? Yeah. Um, give me like two or three months. I could probably do it. I probably want a year because uh, I I work so f like I I want to speak to so many people about what they'd be looking for, especially if the continuity is. Uh, Oh, is it after the sequels? Or is it, it would have to be before, right? Yeah, no, it, it's literally like uh, you'd be doing The Last Jedi. Right. Well, ugh, still, yeah, I would need a lot of time to do that. The thing is, Every... you wouldn't need to speak to anyone because you know the character is inside and out. So, Well, that's the thing, though. I I would want to... If I'm handling someone <clears throat> like a Luke Skywalker, I want to speak to people who I trust who also love Luke Skywalker, you know what I mean? Yeah. And run over a couple of ideas on what could be seen and done. Um, intelligent crayon eater. Drinker, have you watched uh, Shenandoah? 1965 Jimmy Stewart film about a widowed man trying to keep his family out of the US Civil War and stay neutral as the war rages around them until forced to act. I have not seen that one, I'm afraid, and I totally butchered the name. I'm not even familiar with that one. Shenandoah. No. Nah. Sorry, man. Um, Leber Howe says, Season 4 of Farscape is still good. Fight me, Drinker. Alright, well, name the place. <laughs> 
No, I mean, I was taking the piss the other night a little bit. I was speaking in generalities, but um, it had the occasional really good episodes. Uh, but it was so spotty. It was so, um, yeah, up and down, I suppose. Uh, I think I at think that they... point, like, I don't mind because of how much I like the characters and I just want to see more of them, you know? Yeah. I think it's just because season three was so dramatically satisfying. They had a perfect balance of like interesting, kind of quirky episodes, but also a really strong overarching narrative that that tied everything together and really, you know, dramatic moments that hit home brilliantly. And I feel feel like season four it just went too much into the quirkiness, and there was too many just weird experimental episodes that that didn't work. And it was very much more episodic. That strong overarching story wasn't there in season four. Um, I, I'd be interested to know what happened behind the scenes that caused such a shift because something was clearly off kilter about that season um, Jay Fraser says <clears throat> excuse me breaking Superman legacy has been retitled to Superman also the characters of Otis and Eve Teschmacher from the Donner films have been added yeah they have changed the title haven't they so it's not Superman legacy anymore yeah, as far as I know, it's just Superman, right? Right, okay. Uh, yeah, beyond that, I don't know much about it. I just hope it's good, I suppose. Thadius says, watched Top Secret last night. Kilmer was so cool. Yeah, he was good in that, actually. Uh, Zachary Jarvie, bring back OJ, the OG Nordberg. <laughs> I, you know, he's not doing much these days, but I don't think he's going to be <laughs> too popular. Uh, we are all devil says diversity from the Greek meaning to tear apart. Interesting. Uh, Jabling, absurd lines delivered in serious voices is the airplane slash naked gun way of comedy. Yes, uh, Leslie Nielsen was a serious actor before becoming the spoof star. Yeah, that was the secret to it. He was deadpan and he played played it dead straight, no matter how ridiculous it was. And he was well, and that's why good. I feel like Liam Neeson might be able to make this work. I don't know. Like, yeah, it could be fun. It won't be as good, but it, like. <clears throat> Uh, Superfly, did you guys hear of the Naked Gun reboot? Liam Neeson and Seth MacFarlane. Uh, yeah, we, we were just talking about that there. Uh, Joe Rama says, Hi, Drinker. Just wanted to say congrats on Rogue Elements. It must be extremely rewarding as a writer to see your art come to life. Glad to get you get to experience it. Looking forward to the premiere. Thank you. And yeah, it's been great. Um, on the Kickstarter and on Patreon and stuff, I'm releasing um, behind the scenes um, featurettes that they've made. And it's so cool, like listening to the actors get interviewed about playing these roles. And it's like, shit, these are characters that I just dreamed up from from my head. And now there they are on screen. People are performing them and talking about them and sharing their opinions of them. That's yeah. cool. I like that. Um, Virtue says, Drinker, just finished The Last Kingdom. The movie finale was garbage, but the show itself was phenomenal. What's uh, the Brit take on an English epic? Now... Interestingly, never really watched it. Um, I watched like the first couple of episodes and just sort of lost interest. I think maybe that kind of historical epic's not really my thing. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not really in a place to judge it, I'm afraid. Tsunami, <clears throat> I'm re-watching the Avatar show. It's so good at character development. I'm confident it would surprise you all and even earn a drinker recommends. So that's the good one, isn't it? That's the cartoon that's meant to be great. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Are you talking about Atlas? Uh, yes. I assume that's um, what it is. Yeah, uh, a lot of people consider it one of the greatest things of all time. So, like I said, don't rule it out just because I didn't like it. Yeah. Uh, Josu Manuel Mendez says, Hail to the open bar. I wanted to share that the Mary Sue wrote an article applauding the X-Men 97 Rogue redesign and removal of her ass. Why am I not fucking surprised by that? Now I know not to support the X people and only watch the old X Men. Yeah, if the Mary Sue endorses it, I think you can guarantee that it's uh, it's shit. And I can't wait for that site to die. Seems like they're on life support at this point. Um, Occam Asylum says shout out to Mauler and Platoon for their video essays. My new favorite rabbit hole. Mm. Uh, Mister Napsky or the Napsky says drinker. Did you ever see Godzilla minus one minus color epic flick? Haven't seen it yet, but I will. Um, yeah, very much enjoyed the cover version, so interesting to see the difference. The Master says, any chance of arranging a talk with Chris Stockman, Chris Gore, and Drinker, since you and Gore are real f critics and filmmakers, deflects your cred over him. 
<laughs> I mean, no, it's. I don't think Chris Stockman would want to talk to us. What do you think, Mauler? Uh, I don't even think he talks to people in general that much at all anyway. I don't know how many podcasts he even goes on, but I don't think he'd ever be convinced it would be a wise choice in any way, shape, or form. Like, one, he'd probably think it would be uncivil, which it wouldn't. Two, he probably think it would be a bad career choice, like, because we're going to ask him difficult questions. Um, I think probably... it would be, yeah, to be fair, it would be a bad choice because I don't think he'd be able to answer any of those questions. That's what I'm saying. Like, he can't. The problem is, like, to talk to us would mean, first of all, that several of his fans would be exposed to the fact that we're not monsters, <laughs> like, which would be neat for us, but not really beneficial to it. Not that I would say that's his, like, motivation to not let them see it, but that he would then have to deal with us basically being like, so you think it's good to not criticize a film, but to simultaneously admit you will not criticize any film that is bad, thus reviewing the film poorly. And then, you know, talked about him all the stuff we went over on the on the EFAP about it. I'd like to talk to him about all those things. I want to see what his perspective, I want to mine insight out of that man. I believe something <laughs> exists in there. It's Gotta like, be. It's like you're locked in a room with him. Like You're not getting out until I get some kind of insight from like, you. <laughs> I feel like he's uh, he's buried it under layers and layers of filters of being careful. Like, yeah, um, uh, he's probably the most careful content creator on YouTube, which is fundamentally going to make you incredibly boring. I would advise that we all be a little bit careful, at least somewhat, with what we say because of TOS and the the vulture that is YouTube. We're often waiting to just eat a corpse as soon as they can find one. But um, with him, yeah, I don't know. I just uh, I'd want to hear him actually say something interesting and real. And then of course there's the time. I don't know if he actually has it. He's probably pretty busy. I mean, he's yeah, not he's really a... spending it on YouTube right now. He's probably spending it on trying to make a career. So, Yeah, he's a serious filmmaker now, Mauler. Don't but if you were interested, we would treat him well. He yeah. could. I would even say, like, you can just veto the question if you want. Yeah, I mean, I think, at the very least, you could assume he would go into it with probably you know, good faith. You know, he doesn't seem like a bad faith actor when it comes to discussion yeah. of film it's just like he, he would be reluctant to say anything really that would be the only thing well, like, you look at his old stuff and he talks about movies the way that we do you know not yeah. the same points and stuff but the same sort of zeal and i just i, just, like, let's just, I want to talk to that guy i guess yeah uh lost 77 says it would be surreal if chris stockman did a review of drinker's movie <laughs> i Fuck don't yeah. think he would it would be it would be cool i just don't think he would uh have the balls to do it not because I'm going to do something bad to him or anything. I just think he knows if he was to be harsh on it, it would rile up my fan base um, and they would come after him. And There's that. There's also his it. logic of not wanting to do anything other than film celebration. So I guess what he should do is promote you. If uh, you know, you're know you you're an indie filmmaking sort of darling from YouTube who's trying to start up his career just like Chris, just like so many others. He should be like, look, help him out. But help, yeah. help, help a guy out, Chris. I think he probably, <laughs> he's probably, for all we know, he probably thinks we're monsters. Like, you never, like, with the clips and what people say casually, you never know. Yeah. Uh, Reverend John says, When will we see a drinker recommends for children of men? God, I would need to go back and rewatch it. I think if, when people ask me about that movie, the thing that just sticks in my head is just like the technical aspects of it like how demanding it must have been to film like really long action sequences in one continuous shot which it does really well and i got respected for that from a filmmaking perspective it's it's well done it's a good movie i can't really remember that much about the story that really stuck out for me um just it's an intriguing concept i suppose but yeah i would really need to rewatch it before i can give you a proper opinion uh, the Almost Dead Man says, far beyond the stars uh, for a better DS9 favorite because it's real. All right, I need to look that one up. Uh, Darth Soldier says, I don't understand the hype for Deadpool. It's literally Ryan Reynolds playing Ryan Reynolds, just like he does in every other movie from Van Wilder to Green Lantern. Yeah, but I like, just... depending on the writing, that can be really fun. Yeah, I mean, I do sort of get where he's coming from in that Ryan Reynolds can sometimes be a bit much. You know, and you almost start to feel fatigue with some of his movies, and the Deadpool films are perhaps an example of that, where it's like, okay, every single line of dialogue doesn't have to be a gag, Ryan. You can chill out a little bit. Um, and yeah, maybe there's an element of trying a bit too hard. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, like generally, I like him. I think he is a pretty funny guy, and he's a likable guy. Like, he's probably the sort of guy you could actually have a good night out with and just drink a few beers and chat movies, and like, he would be. You'd be pretty chill. Yeah. Like more so than a lot of Hollywood actors, I'd imagine. Um, 
He also says, Tom Cruise in Tropic Thunder. Yes, that is a thing, and it's a good thing. A good thing, yes. Amistad says, Hail Drinker, an amazing panel. This year looks pretty dry for exciting new content, but hopefully Arcane Season 2 will drop in November. Are there by any chance an unbridled praise in the works for Season 1, Mauler? Not really, no, but uh, obviously we'll be covering the shit out of that a second it comes out, because uh, the EFAP peoples are hyper-passionate about Arcane, and then a lot of them are familiar with LOL to an extent that's pretty useful as well, so... We'll catch it around this time properly. It took us ages to watch the first season last time. Everyone was like, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it, yeah. watch it. We were like, eh. <laughs> yeah. Did I not have to try and persuade you to watch it? Or did you I recommend think you it did. I, I, I yeah. think you did. I think you... That is right, right? I think you told me to watch it, right? At least, along with other people. I think it was, yeah, because like a lot of people had recommended it to me through like Patreon and stuff. And then, yeah, I eventually gave it a go. And I was like, oh, shit, this is actually really good. I thought Mauler's probably going to appreciate this. I was fully hooked after the third episode. I was so impressed. It's been so long since I've watched something that has balls. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's the one thing I really hope is in season two. It's just a, a story. Even one storytelling choice that makes me go, ah, oh, they still got their balls good. <laughs> uh, last one here is from Martina Skripka. He says, hello, what's your opinion on, the, on poor things? Personally, I like the idea, but I think it was poorly executed and way too long. So I feel like that movie just passed me by, and I, I know basically nothing about it. So, I, yeah, I can't really give you much insight into that one, I'm afraid. What film, sorry? Poor Things. Oh, yeah, I haven't seen that yet. So, uh, so let's see, who was in it? Again, uh, Emma Stone, yeah. Mark Ruffalo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. I had to turn me off a movie. Either Mark Ruffalo or fucking Pedro Pascal. Willem Dafoe was in it as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I couldn't answer the overall question about whether it's good or overrated or whatever because I know nothing about it. I just didn't have much interest in watching it. Uh, but that was the final Super Chat. So thank you, everyone, for asking us all these questions. At least Pedro Pascal's not in it, right? No, he's not. No. <laughs> So should I just do that? Like watch movies that specifically don't have Pedro Pascal in them? Basically. Yeah. That's like three a year at least. <laughs> yeah. So who's, more, who's more annoying? Like Pedro Pascal or Mark Ruffalo? It's Surely tough. it's Mark Ruffalo, right? Well, I feel like Pedro's done more impressive acting than Mark Ruffalo has. Yeah. Yeah, because like every time I, I like say I think Mark Ruffalo is just phoning it in in his latest MCU movie. Everyone's like, oh yeah, but he was in Zodiac. He was good in that. And it's like, yes, but that was like 15 years ago. That's yeah, it's not that he hasn't time. ever been good or anything. It's just the, yeah. Um, but anyway, well, that's the end of our Super Chat Catch-Up. So thank you guys. Thank you for all the awesome questions. And we will catch you on the next Open Bar. But until then, that's all we got for today. So go away now. Bye-bye. <laughs>